أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من شر نفسي وسيئات عملي وشياطين الجن والإنس بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمين الله في أرضك السلام عليك يا بقية الله يا ابن الحسن عجل على ظهوره صلوات اللهم صل على محمد وعلى I seek refuge with God Almighty from every form of evil. I begin in the name of God, the Beneficent, the Merciful. All praise belongs to God, Lord of all worlds. And I ask Him to shower peace and blessings upon the ones whom He sent in order to show us how to reach our potential, to reach excellence on every level in the best way possible. So he sent us examples, role models, those who were pure enough in their hearts and in their actions to be conduits for God's mercy to the rest of creation. He sent them as mercy. He sent them as guidance. He sent them as guides. He sent them, especially the seal of all of them, the final messenger amongst them, the seal of all prophets and messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the Quran describes, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We have not sent you except as a mercy to all the worlds. He is the conduit for God's mercy to all the worlds. That is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. God left the best for last when it came to sending the prophets and messengers. But he also made sure that the message of that final seal, that seal of all prophets and messengers, the mercy to all the worlds, was not in vain. It was not merely for the people of his time. And then everybody else can just figure things out on their own. Rather, it was a message to survive until the day of judgment. Until the purpose of this world, لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That he may test you to see which of you is of best in their deeds, is of best in passing this exam. Until the day of judgment, this message, this prescription, this guide, this guide to how to do best on the exam will be accomplished through the preservation, through the protection, through the guardianship of the ones chosen by God to guard the message. Those are the awsiya, the guardians of the message, the a'imma, the imams. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about how to take the Quranic approach in discovering who Ahlul Bayt are. Who the guardians of the message are. What do we find if we were to look merely through the lens of the Quran? There are many different ways to come to know things. Sometimes you use philosophy to come to understand things. Sometimes you use the natural sciences to come to understand things. Sometimes you use history to come to understand things. Sometimes you use experiments to come to understand things. There are different ways to understand things. 
Similarly, when it comes to knowing Ahl al-Bayt, knowing the guardianship of Ahl al-Bayt, knowing the guardianship of the 12 Imams, <laughs> there are different methodologies to employ. There are different ways to reach the same conclusion. The way that we've been focusing on yesterday and today continuing is the methodology using only the Holy Quran. This Quran, what's so special about the Quran? Well, as you all know, the Holy Quran is the one source reference that all Muslims agree on. This is the Word of God. So if you want to make an argument and somebody else amongst the Muslims doesn't agree with your references to the Hadith in, for example, Al-Kafi or some of the other Shi'i sources of Hadith, references or compilations of Hadith, they want an argument that comes from the Holy Qur'an because that's what they agree with you about. You either give them an argument from the Holy Qur'an or you give them an argument from something that they also agree on. This is one of the reasons why we're looking through the Holy Qur'an. But even further, it's also because we believe something so important would not have been left unaddressed by the Qur'an. Something as important as guarding the message of the Prophet would not have been left without any note or reference in the book sent to be a guide for all of humanity. Sure, the Qur'an does tell us whatever the Prophet gives you, take it. And whatever he forbids you from, stay away from it. The Quran also says, "In kuntum tuhib qul, in kuntum tuhibun Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhibkum Allah." If you love Allah, if you love God, if you love the One who is the cause of all causes, the One who is beyond all limitations, the One to whom your heart submits with truest the truest of submission, Allah, then follow me. The Quran tells Prophet Muhammad, tell Allah. them, Allah. 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 if you love Allah, if you love God, then follow me and God will love you. And He'll forgive you your sins. The Quran does tell us this much. So at the very least we know, look at what the Prophet said. Discover what you can figure out the Prophet actually said. Go and research through these compilations of hadith and figure out what did the Prophet actually say, what was made up, what was misunderstood, what was corrupted over time, what was misinterpreted. Figure it out. When you know what the Prophet said, follow it. Because if you do, then God will love you and He will forgive you your sins. Yes, but does the Quran make it even clearer than that? You may go and research in the hadith and you find that there's many hadith from Shi'i and non-Shi'i sources that tell us that the number, alaykum salam, that the number of khulafa after Prophet Muhammad, the number of successors, Muhammad, the number of successors after Prophet Muhammad is the same as the number of the nuqaba of Bani Israel, mentioned in a verse in the Holy Quran. Ithnay ashara naqiban. This the specific number mentioned of those who were in the station of Ulil Amr. The Ulil Amr in the nation of, or the community of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those with the Amr, those with that Amr, that, that authority, obey God and obey the Messenger and the Ulil Amr amongst you. These so analogous to them in amongst the children of Israel were called the Nuqaba. They were number 12 as specifically mentioned in the Quran. In the Hadith heritage you find from Shia and non-Shia sources, you find that Prophet Muhammad has said, the number of Imams after me, the number of Khulafa after me, my successors, they will be numbered the same as the number of the Nuqaba of Bani Israel. The same number. This is just one of the prototypes, one of the examples of the reports that talk about the 12 number of Imams or the successors or leaders that come after Prophet Muhammad. Other reports you find mention it in a different phrase, in a different kind of wording that says this 
faith will remain glorified or will remain azizan until there will be 12, 12 khalifas. The gist of the meaning I'm relaying to you. And you find in different versions of the reports from the non Shia sources, some of them say that, that these individuals, the enemies that may, may show animosity towards them doesn't do them any harm. In other words, their leadership is not subject to the choices and the agreement of people. Their leadership is established regardless what people say, regardless who chooses to make them their enemies. These are the 12. You find in history, these, who were they? Who were the main rulers in Islam after Prophet Muhammad? Did they fall, did they fall under the, the description of these 12 leaders? These 12 leaders were analogous to the ones appointed for the children of Israel. These who were supposed to be in the position to be obeyed, guides. This is the type of discussion you would have if you were leading a discussion in the compilations of hadith. But we're talking about the Qur'an today, continuing from yesterday. How far can the Qur'an take us on its own without going to the hadith? Can the Qur'an on its own lead us to know that there are imams appointed by God? That they are the ones representing the straight path, never deviating from it. They are the ones who are completely on the path. If they were to swerve even a bit, then to that extent they would not be on that path. When you say in Surah Al-Fatiha, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim," Guide us to the straight path or guide us the straight path itself. اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ mustaqim." Guide us the straight path itself. If in any choice somebody is not guided, meaning if in any choice a person swerves or is crooked relative to what is the right and the truth, is that the straight path? If a person errs, makes a mistake, is that the straight path? You see, ماذا بعد الحق إلا الضلال After the truth, what is there? Is there anything but misguidance? You see, you're either on the path of guidance or you're not. You can't say, I'm on the path of guidance while I'm making a mistake and while I'm erring, while I'm deviating. Sure, God may forgive you. God may forgive me. But to the extent that I was erring, that I was making a mistake, regardless whether it was intentional or not, that is not the straight path. The straight path is the path where there is no crookedness, there is no error, there is no mistake, there is no misguidance. Whether it's knowing or absent-mindedly, whether it's aliman amidan or sahiyan jahilan, in any case, the straight path is the path we ask God to guide us to in every choice so that we are never in the wrong. We are never going away from what is right and what is best. So when you pray to God, المستقيم, guide us the straight path, the path or the upright path, the path, عليهم, the path of those whom you have blessed. الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Who are they? We talked about that yesterday. We're following the leads of the Qur'an to figure out who are those who possess that path, who are so closely associated with that path, that upright path, who are so associated with it that the Qur'an is saying it is their path. Meaning it's a path where there is no going astray, there is no error, there is no mistake. It's an infallible path. It's an impeccable path. It's a pure path. And those whom God has blessed, it is their path. So we're asking the Qur'an, O Qur'an, show us who has God blessed, such that we may look for them and realize that we need to follow their path. Sirat al an'amta alayhim. The path of those you have blessed. 
We looked through the Quran and we found another verse, two verses actually, that refer to those who God has blessed. Just as a quick review, especially for those who were with us yesterday, we talked about these. I'm trying to get through them a little quickly so I can move on to the next part. But just so that we're all on the same page, one of the verses says, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Whoever obeys God in the Messenger, they are with, with who? Those whom God has blessed. And then he explains to us who are they. He says, including the prophets and the truthful and the witnesses and the righteous. So here there's clearly two different groups. The prophets and those who are not prophets, but they are the truthful, the witnesses and the righteous. Now remember, if these are the same ones God has blessed that are mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha, they have to be the ones that are impeccable because the path, the straight path is impeccable. If their path is the straight path, then they have to be impeccable. So here in this verse when it says the prophets and the other guys, the truthful, the witnesses and the righteous, they must be the truthful, the witness and the righteous who are impeccable, infallible, but they're not prophets. The prophets are on one hand, the truthful, the righteous, and the witnesses are on the other hand. The, another verse confirms this. It says, By the way, the previous verse was verse from chapter 4, verse 69. If you want to take notes or look up this on your own. The next verse, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ آدَمْ Those are the ones whom God has blessed from among the prophets of Adam's progeny. وَمِمَّنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحٍ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْرَائِيلِ وَمِمَّنْ هَدَيْنَا وَاجْتَبَيْنَا They are those whom God has blessed from among the prophets of Adam's progeny. So who are they? The ones God has blessed? There are prophets from Adam's progeny, that's one. And from the progeny, so prophets from the progeny of those we carried with Noah, that's another part, a group of them, there are still prophets. And from among the progeny of Abraham and Israel, so also prophet Abraham, his descendants, there were prophets amongst them, who were they? Ismail, Ishmael, and Isaac, Ishaq. And he says, Israel. Israel is another name for prophet Yaqub, Jacob, Israel. And now he mentions another group, but it's not a prophet group. It's not a group of prophets. It says, وَمِمَّنْ هَدَيْنَا وَاجْتَبَيْنَا And from, um, from among those we guided and chose. So paralleling the previous verse where there was a group that God has blessed which are not prophets, and there's a group that God has blessed that are prophets, also in this verse we find... <coughs> Several groups amongst the prophets that God mentions their, their forefathers. And then there's a group of those whom we have guided and chosen. Paralleling the previous verse I mentioned, where there were not prophets, but they were those who God has blessed. Now let's look in the Quran for who are those whom God has chosen and blessed. And by the way, that was from uh, verse... 19 from chapter 19 verse 58 next we look at this verse from chapter 6 verses 86 and 87 wa wal yasa'a wa yunus wa luta wa kullan faddalna 'ala al-'alamin wa min aba'ihim wa dhurriyatihim wa ikhwanihim wajtabaynahum wa hadaynahum ila siratin mustaqim and Ishmael, Elisha, Jonah, and Lot. Each we graced over all the worlds. And from among their fathers, their descendants, and brethren, we chose them and guided them to a straight path. So it's telling us who is it that was chosen and guided to a straight path. Connecting the previous verse 
a group that is chosen and guided, but they're not prophets. And to them belongs the straight path. You link that reference to this verse. And it also says, those we have there, we chose them and guided them to a straight path. Who are they? Remember, we're looking for those amongst them who are not prophets. The verse says, Ishmael, he's a prophet. That couldn't be who we're referring to here. Elisha, Jonah, and Lot, each of these references, most of them at least are prophets. We grace them over all of the worlds. And from among their fathers, okay, amongst their fathers, there were prophets like Abraham, Isaac, the father of Jacob. Ishmael's father is who? Abraham. So amongst their fathers, that includes Abraham. His forefathers include Noah. And then from amongst their descendants, who are the descendants of Ishmael? Ismail. Who is special amongst the descendants of Ismail? Prophet Muhammad is the first one who comes to your mind, right? Uh, but Allah remember, Allah 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 Muhammad Allah. Muhammad Muhammad. we're connecting it to the previous verse. We're looking for ones who are not prophets, but they have been guided and chosen. So who are they? Who are the ones from the descendants of Ismail? However, they were not prophets. They were guided and chosen, but they were not prophets. This is a clear indication that there's somebody special we're looking for, or people that are special we're looking for, from the descendants of Ismail. Next verse that we connect is from chapter 2, verses 128 to 129. Well, this is when Prophet Abraham and Ismail are praying to God. As they're building the Kaaba, they're praying to God. And the Quran recounts their prayer. رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ Our Lord, make us Muslimain to you. And from among our progeny, an ummah which is Muslim. And show us our rights of worship and turn to us clemently. Indeed, you are the all-clement, the all-merciful. Our Lord, raise amongst them a messenger from among them who should recite to, you, to them your signs and teach them the book and wisdom and you zakki him. Okay, if you remember from yesterday, there were two key points here I mentioned on this verse. One was, look at the type of prayer he's making. Is he simply saying, make us Muslims like every other Muslim? Like that just submits to God and says, I bear witness there's no God but God and Muhammad's the messenger? These were two who already were prophets. Abraham and Ismail. Already prophets. So you think they were already Muslims? They were already Muslims in the general sense. So what is the prayer he's making? He's making a prayer for a special, intense level of submission to God. A special level that even the prophets are asking for. A prophet, Abraham, a prophet, Ismail. They are prophets and they're making a prayer to give us that high level of Islam. What is that level of Islam they're praying for? That is beyond the level of a prophet. What is that? They're asking for a level of submission that transcends the level of a prophet. And then they make the same prayer for their descendants. And make from amongst our descendants, Ummatan Muslima. A, co a Muslim community from our, our descendants using the same wording. Extending the prayer to our descendants. Okay, this is the first point I mentioned on this verse yesterday. The second point is, he says, amongst that Umm al-Muslimah, who has that high station of Islam that they're praying for them to have. The station of Islam, which is a station a prophet is praying to have. That Umm al-Muslimah, he is praying that God will send from amongst them a messenger. He will choose from amongst that community, that high level Islamic community, 
that high level of submission to God, that community that has that high level of submission to God, from amongst that community, he's praying God send from amongst them a messenger. So amongst that select group, he chooses a messenger. What does that messenger do? That messenger recites to them your signs and teaches them the book and wisdom. And in Arabic, the word yuzakkihim. Now, sometimes this word is translated as purify them. This I didn't mention yesterday. However, while it's possible this verse is referring to purification, if you realize the level, the spiritual level of this group that the Prophet is chosen from them, this is a special group that has a special level of submission to God. And the Prophet, the Messenger is chosen from amongst them. So they're already of a high level of status when it comes to purification and submission to God. Right? So what does it mean when he says, and purify them? Yuzakkihim. You could say it's similar to how in Ayat al-Tathir, when God says in verse 33, 33, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ الْبَيْتِ وَيُطَهِّرَكُمْ God indeed wishes to, to, keep, to keep away from you all indecency, all filth, all rich, and to purify you a thorough purification. So it's a level of purification that it doesn't mean they were sinful before. It means that it's a special level of elevation of their status. You could say, okay, maybe Yuzakim here means purification in that sense. But another possibility is that Yuzakim here is being used in the other linguistic sense that Yuzakim has. Tazkiya is like, does it, it doesn't only mean to purify. Another meaning for Tazkiya is to praise, to, con condole, to, condole, to condole something, to, to praise somebody, to speak in a high, in a high regard about somebody. Or something. And in one verse in the Quran it says, فَلَا لَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ Something to the sense of, do not praise yourself. God knows who is truly pious. Don't speak highly of yourself. God knows who is truly of a high status. In this verse then, it could be that God is telling, the, 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 the prayer is that God sent from amongst them a messenger who will teach them, your, who will show them your signs, who will teach them, and who will... He will praise them. He will tell people, look, these are, the, these are the guardians. These are the ones of an elevated status. These are the witnesses. These are the righteous. These are the truthful. He speaks highly of them. That's another possibility. So either way, it's regarding, it's not speaking of somebody who he's trying to purify them from sins. Like the general public. It's speaking of somebody who they are already of an elevated status of submission to God of a status of submission to God that Prophet Abraham and Prophet Ismail themselves were asking God to raise them to that status. Rabbana وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ if, if it's clear so far, please raise your hand. Okay, let me just repeat it one more, one more time in summary, just so that I can move on to the next part. In this verse, رَبَّنَا وَجْعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ A prophet, Abraham, no doubt about that. Another prophet, Ismail, no doubt about that. They are both prophets, and they're making a prayer. They're making a prayer, O oh God, make us Muslimain. Make us submitting to you. Prophets praying for just being Muslims? Does that make sense? Well, the name, the word Muslim here is not being used in the sense of a typical it's being Muslim in the typical sense we look at today. It's looking at a level of submission to God that even a prophet is asking for. So it's a level of submission to God that a prophet is yearning for. And then he couples that prayer with a prayer not for himself and for his son, Ismail. 
He's praying for amongst his progeny that God will make from amongst his progeny a Muslim community. But he uses the same wording, giving the sense that it's the same level of Islam that he's praying for for himself. It's a high level of Islam that he's asking for from amongst his progeny. Ummatan muslimatan lak. And then he says, and send from amongst that group a messenger. A messenger from amongst that group that's already of that high level of Islam. Now, you may be wondering, oh, maybe this verse is just saying, these are the general Muslims, the general Muslim population, and then amongst them was chosen a messenger. Some people might want to make the objection. Maybe it's not convincing enough that this prayer was coupled with the first prayer, which is a prayer of a prophet praying for a level of Islam beyond the one he already has. If that's not clear enough to you, then look at the next verse that I'm connecting this to. Again, what we're doing here is we're looking at the leads from the Qur'an alone. Linking verse to verse from the Qur'an itself. This verse that I just read was from chapter 2, verses 128 to 129. The next verse I'll be reading is from 22, chapter 22, verse 78. In this verse it says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَ جَتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَفِي هَذَا لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ and strive for the sake of God, a striving which is worthy of Him. He has chosen you. So again, here we have the word ijtaba. Remember from the previous verses, we're looking for the ones who God has blessed. Those to whom belongs the straight path. They are upright. They do not swerve from the straight path. They are impeccably guided. Because the straight path belongs to them. They are who? The prophets and another group that are not prophets, but they have been guided and chosen by God. That word chosen, ijtaba, is used in this verse. Addressing that group, God says, strive for the sake of God, a striving which is worthy of Him. He has chosen you, ijtabakum, and He has not placed for you any hardship in the religion the faith of your father Abraham. He named you Al-Muslimin, those submitting to God before. And in this, in this Quran, so that the messenger may be a witness to you. The messenger is a witness upon you. He's witnessing over you. He's the one who's watching over you. He is the one who is the witness, the shahid, the alaykum. And you, you who God has chosen, you may be a witness to mankind, everybody else. So you see, the group that God sent the messenger from amongst them is a group that has been chosen by God to be witnesses to the rest of humanity. Linking all of these verses together from the entry point in Surah Al-Fatiha, we come to the conclusion that the ones Siratul Ladina and Amta Alayhim, when you read every day, more than ten times probably most of us, or many of us, more than ten times a day. Guide us to the straight path or guide us the straight path. Show us the straight path itself. Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim, the path of those who you have blessed, whom you have blessed. Look for in the Quran references to those who God has blessed. You will find that it's a reference to the prophets and another group which has been described as the truthful, the righteous, and the witnesses. Another verse describes them as prophets and it mentions which progeny of prophets and it mentions that another group that God has chosen and blessed, guided and chosen. 
Following that lead, you look for who are those who God has chosen and blessed, or God, God has guided and chosen. You find that from amongst the descendants of Ismail, there's a group of them. Who are the descendants of Ismail? You come to the verse that we read before the last one, in which there's a prayer by Abraham and Ismail, Ismail, his son, two prophets praying that God elevate their level of submission to God beyond the level that it is already at. And to send, to have also from amongst their descendants a community which is also of the elevated status of submission to God. Connecting these verses together, therefore, there is from the descendants of Ismail, some who are not prophets, but they have been chosen and guided. They are from among the descendants of Ismail. They have been guided and chosen. They are of an elevated status of submission to God. Such an elevated status that was coupled with the prayer of a prophet who made a prayer for himself using the same wording in the Quran. Their level of submission to God is a level that even a prophet was asking for. From amongst them, the Quran tells us the prayer continued that send from amongst them a messenger from amongst that group a messenger and that messenger would recite to them the signs he would teach them the wisdom and he would use a key him which either means the purification similar to how in the verse of Tathir you have purification even though there is no sin or it could mean the sense of Yuzakim, the sense of praising and showing people their elevated status by speaking highly of them. In the last verse I mentioned, or the, the, the current verse I was reading, it says that these individuals are the witnesses over all other people. The messenger is a witness on them, he's a witness to them, and they are the witnesses to the rest of humankind. So, is this Ummah al-Muslimah, this Muslim Ummah that was described here in this specific sense by linking the verses of the Qur'an, is this a group of individuals that is misguided at any point? If they were misguided at any point, then they would not, the, the straight path would not belong to them. They are the ones who the path of uprightness belongs to them. Sirat al an'amta alayhim. The path of those you have blessed. You're asking God to guide you in every choice to the path, that straight path. Are you asking God to guide you to a choice where you could be making a mistake? Knowingly or unknowingly? Or are you asking God to guide you to the path where you're always doing the right thing? You're always in the right path. Yeah, we may not always successfully be on that path, but we always make that prayer. Every day in our prayers, at least two times we say this. Guide us to that path. So I ask you, and let's all reflect with our fellow brothers in Islam. When we make this prayer to God, are we asking God to show us a path where there's somebody who is only most of the time guided? Or is it somebody who's always guided? If they were only... If they were most of the time guided, but sometimes not guided, then why am I asking God to guide me to that path while they're not guided? I'm asking God to guide me to them when they are always guided. So that in every choice I am guided. If those people were not guided, even a little bit at any point, in any choice they made, then I'm not asking God to guide me to that path at that point. I'm asking Him to guide me to the path of those who are always making the right choice. Always making a choice that is guided. Always making a choice that is... What is that? That is not deviating, deviating from the straight path. That is one of the ways you know that this Ummah al-Muslimah, this special Muslim community from amongst whom the messenger was chosen, is ma'soom. Is pure. Is impeccable. Does not err. God protects them. They are the guides. They are the ones who God has guided and chosen. This is only looking from the verses of the Quran. But let's go a step further. In the Quran, we read 
صلوا على محمد وال محمد اللهم صل على محمد وال ومن يطع الله والرسول فأولئك مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا This is repeating one of the verses we said before just to remember that those who God has blessed are not only the prophets they are including the prophets that's on one hand and then whenever you add you put a conjunction typically it means that there's a difference between the one you're adding and the one you've added to. The prophets and, oh, so somebody that's not a prophet. And the truthful, the witnesses and the righteous. These are individuals who are truthful, righteous and witnesses, yet not prophets. Next, you read in another verse that there are some people that were envied. The Quran talks about them. It says, أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا آتَاهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِ فَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا Or do they envy the people for what God has given them out of His grace? We have certainly given the progeny of Abraham the book and wisdom, and we have given them a great sovereignty, a great authority. It said the progeny of Abraham. Now, in light of the verses we've read so far, the progeny of Abraham is not only through Isaac. It's not only through the prophets from Isaac that include, no, that, that, that include Moses and Jesus, that include Joseph, Moses, and Jesus. It's also through the progeny of Ismail that includes Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But it's not only that. If you remember the verse where we read, it started with Ismail and it said from amongst their fathers and their descendants and their brethren and from amongst and it mentioned that those we have guided and chosen, meaning that there was those who were juxtaposed with the group of prophets. There were those who were guided and chosen, as I mentioned in one of the earlier verses, and then there were the prophets. So from amongst Al-Ibrahim, it's not only prophets, it's also that group of those who God has guided and chosen. And it mentions these as a number of individuals who were envied. Why were they envied? God says, we have certainly given the progeny of Abraham the book and wisdom, and we have given them a great sovereignty, mulkan azima, authority, dominion. They have the, the they have the rulership. Who are these individuals? Now we we'll continue with the links and the leads. Where does the Quran speak of this authority, this type of, this right to have the obedience of people? This right to have people follow what they say. Where is this? You find this in another verse. Notice the verse where it says, Allah wa ati'u rasula wa ulil amri minkum. Obey God and obey the messenger and those with authority or those with the amr amongst you. What is the amr? Let's put that aside. We know whatever it is, this is a group of individuals that has been, to, we're told that we have to obey them coupled with the obedience of the messenger. Obey God and obey the messenger and those with the Amr amongst you. It didn't even repeat the word obey twice for, for the, the third group. It didn't repeat it again for the third group. It just used it once for the messenger and for that group. Obey God and obey the messenger and the ulil amr amongst you. So their obedience is coupled with obedience to the Prophet. And that together is coupled with obedience to God. These are the ones with authority who are not prophets. Connecting all of these verses together, what do you get? What picture is being painted before you? What is the scene that we see the Qur'an is showing us? And notice, 
in nothing that I have said so far am I referring to any esoteric meanings or hidden meanings. This is all just taking the apparent meaning of the verses, linking each of the verses together. Simply by referring to the meaning of a word or a phrase in the verse, where else does this appear in the Quran? Those who would have memorized the Quran would have had this in memory. They would have been able to make the links if you brought it to their attention. But if you don't have the Quran memorized, the, the thing you can do is you can use a search engine and see where do these words re repeat in the Quran. And you start to make the links in this way. Another verse in the Quran says, and this is from Surah 2, verse 124. وَإِذِ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُمْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِي قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِ الظَّالِمِينَ And when his Lord tested Abraham with certain kalimat, he tested him in some way, God knows how, and he fulfilled them. Abraham passed the test. God then says to him, I am making you the Imam of mankind. This person who was a prophet, now God is granting him a status, a station of being the Imam of mankind. Then Abraham says, and from among my descendants, notice how the Quran referred to a special prayer that Abraham made for his descendants in earlier verses that I mentioned. And it referred to how God has given the progeny of Abraham such knowledge of the book and has given them this dominion, this mulkan azimah. Abraham asks here, does my progeny also from my descendants, do they have this status that you just gave me of the imama? And then God responds, my ahd, translated here as my pledge, does not extend to the unjust of dhalimeen. It doesn't extend to those who have done wrong. And you know when you do wrong, it's not only to other people you could do wrong. We could be wronging ourselves. Remember in Dua Abi Hamza, perhaps if you remember, towards the end, in Dua Abi Hamza, we read basically the idea of, you say, Oh God, you told us in your book that we should pardon those who have wronged us. And we have wronged ourselves. And you, have a, you are more entitled to forgive us than we are to forgive ourselves. You ask God to forgive us. Why? Because we have wronged ourselves. Wronging ourselves is falling short of doing what is acceptable and what is on the right path. That's wronging ourselves. So God is telling Abraham here, the ones who have done wrong, those who have done injustice, the dhalimeen will not get this pledge. They will not. From amongst your descendants, anybody who has done wrong will not be qualified for this status that I just granted to you. So what does this tell you? This is another confirmation that those who are being referred to in these many verses that we've talked about, in these, all, in these references that are talking about this Ummah al-Muslimah, these references that are talking about those who God has blessed, those to whom belongs the straight path. This is another confirmation that these have not done any wrong. These are individuals, they never stray from the right path. They are not from the dhalimeen. They have never done wrong. At least they have never done wrong in the sense that deviates from the straight path. So, the question then comes, this understanding of Asma that you find amongst the followers of the 12 Imams, this understanding of Asma which believes that the Imams do not only, are not only as the Prophet before them. It's a belief that we have about the Prophets and the Imams. As the Prophet is straight, on the straight path, in what he delivers, in his words, and in his actions. And you cannot separate his personal life 
from his life as a messenger. He is walking, talking revelation. He is walking, talking role model in every aspect of his life. That's the prophet we believe in. And we believe that God would make sure to guard him from all possible errors so that he would be sure to fulfill his objective in the best way possible and never stray from the right path. Neither knowingly nor absent-mindedly. Because even if it were absent-mindedly, that would mean at that point, he's not on the straight path. How would I be asking God to guide me to his path if in that point he's absent-mindedly doing something that is an error or a mistake? The idea of Asma in this sense does not only apply to the Prophet, it applies to everyone who is supposedly who is supposed to be on that straight path completely and at all times, especially to those to whom belongs that straight path. Guide us the straight path. Whose path? The path of those you have blessed. It is the Sirat al Mustaqim. It is always upright. It never deviates from what is upright, neither knowingly nor absent mindedly. And that is why I'm asking God to guide me to that path. This is the path. This is the understanding of Asma that we have in the school of Ahl al Bayt that believes in the 12 Imams. Go east and go west. Will you find the proper understanding of the guardianship of the message and of the Asma? except amongst those who follow the 12 Imams, starting with Imam Ali and ending with an Imam Al-Hujjat ibn Al-Hasan Al-Askari. God Almighty says in the Holy Quran, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّ مُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ And we desire to show favor to those who were oppressed in the land and to make them imams and to make them the inheritors. They're the ones who will inherit the earth. May God hasten the appearance of our holy imam, make us amongst the sincere followers, show us the truth in every way we turn, Show us the truth in the horizons and in ourselves until we realize